Who's your first time in Observability Day? Please raise your hand. Wow. wow. Okay, we should done that in the morning. So we try to do this event in very, very community-based. So what is really important from this event is around the networking and hey, meet good and cool people, learn from each other. So when you get these time breaks for lunch, for coffee, Hey, introduce each other. I work here. I do this. I do that. And you will see that you will get a ton of value. And the goal of this event is to build also community around the observability space. So everybody's joined to is welcome to join us to learn and share knowledge. Okay, so with this, I'm going to introduce our next speaker speaker, Iman Ryan. He comes from Grafana Labs. He introduced himself as somebody who knows a lot of Grafana projects and products. So you can talk to him after the, the session. And he's going to talk to us in this presentation called, but wait, there's still more observability data volumes and strategies for managing them. Let's welcome Damon Ryan. Thank you. Hi folks. Uh, very nice to be able to speak to you today about this very fun topic. Um, I had to do a mad scramble uh, in the last little gap there because during the opening session, I realized that uh, you couldn't read any of the dark screenshots in the presentations, and my whole deck is in a dark theme. Uh, so that was fun. So that's why these two rows of lights are now out. So uh, thanks very much to the venue for accommodating that. Otherwise, um, I would have to guide you through all of the slides verbally, and that wouldn't have been fun for anybody. Uh, so, my name is Eamon Ryan. As Eduardo said, uh, I'm a senior principal field engineer at Grafana Labs. I've been there for over four and a half years now, uh, which is a very long time in Grafana timeframe. Uh, it's only been a company for, uh, we just passed 10 years, actually. Um, so we got some cool 10-year swag for that, and that was really cool. Um, but I'm on the field engineering team, as you might guess, uh, which is at a really fun intersection of engineering and uh, customers and prospective customers at Grafana. So I'm regularly talking to all kinds of folks about their, like their whole observability problems and their data volumes and what they can do about that kind of thing. So I wanted to bring some of that uh, knowledge here. And even if it's only for people to be like, yes, that is a big problem for me too. And you know, then we can all commiserate about it afterwards. So a little bit of uh, history. So we'll go back in time slightly. Uh, apologies if I don't have all the details of this entirely right. Uh, but in the past, metrics, if you had them at all, they were coming from your uh, probably your bare metal servers. Uh, you maybe had some virtual machines, but we're talking about like early days. So if you were using them, you probably didn't have them in production. You were probably sending data into a tool like Zabbix or Nagios. Nagios. I don't actually know how to say it properly. One of those. Uh, maybe you were grabbing SNMP data. Maybe you were running scripts remotely uh, on the machines and sending certain bits of information back. And it worked. But the scale of things was a lot different back in those times. Like Zabbix first came out in 2001. And uh, Nagios came out in 2002. And for just to make everybody feel really old, that was 23 years ago. Uh, so. That certainly makes me feel old as well. This, of course, was pre-AWS, pre-public cloud, uh, pre-cloud native. Uh, AWS or Amazon EC2 only left beta in 2008, which is a whole six years later than these tools uh, launching. So, you know, it was a simpler time. Uh, a better time, perhaps? Maybe. Maybe. We'll save that argument for the bar. So what do metrics look like now? Well, you still have your bare metal servers, but most people are abstracting on top of that. So it's virtual machines. Uh, it's you know, running EC2, which, uh, or Google, Google Compute Engine, or Azure Compute. And uh, if you weren't aware, those instances are virtual machines uh, running on top of hypervisors in those data centers. You just don't see them. Uh, or you might be running vSphere. I'm well acquainted with vSphere, spent eight years at VMware. Uh, so that was, that was my, my bread and butter for many years. Uh, and then you have containers. So 
you know, Docker containers, Podman. Uh, you might be orchestrating containers uh, using Kubernetes uh, or something else. And that all runs great. Um, it's, uh, but basically, it's abstractions all the way down. So it's not just containers or VMs or bare metal. If you're running containers, you're probably running containers on VMs, which are running on bare metal. So a lot of abstractions. And all of those layers can produce metrics designed to both show you how workloads are running, but also even just to help you distinguish what layer problems are even occurring at. Uh, so it's complicated, and it's voluminous. And most people are capturing and sending, sending metrics in, in the open source world to tools like Prometheus uh, or one of its cousins, many compatible cousins, uh, Thanos, Cortex, Mimir, there's a bunch more. Um, or they're sending it to something like InfluxDB and dealing with the metrics that way. Um, or they might also be doing something that's instrumented for OTEL and sending their OTEL uh, format metrics to any one of the tons of compatible backends, which may include Prometheus as well, as you probably know. Uh, but the tool itself, the metrics tool, isn't really important for this talk. The point is that the workload quantities have grown. Uh, the complexity has grown in order to try to manage those workloads more flexibly and efficiently. And then consequently, uh, the metric data volumes have ballooned massively. Tracking metric data can easily be on the order of terabytes per month uh, or per week or even day if you're large enough for some enterprises. On the log side, uh, again, people were, you know, they're pulling logs from their uh, bare metal servers, though things did get a bit more complicated as um, operating systems evolved and you started to get logs from different processes that were separated, different functions of the system, uh, different like just segregation pieces, and then people needed to aggregate those different log streams together. And that's how we ended up with tools like syslog-ng that came out in 98, and or syslog that came out in 2004. Uh, but what does it look like now? Well, you have all those same layers, so I won't build that out again. But each of these, of course, just like metrics, produces all of their own data. Uh, but what else happened? So over time, storage got cheaper, and uh, developers leaned towards writing uh, statements for, to print new log lines more than not. So computers got faster, more powerful, cheaper, and the storage itself got much cheaper. And then that resulted in a situation where now every little service that people write is just spewing log lines constantly, even when things are working totally fine. And we all know that like, log levels exist, but of course, everyone always adheres to log levels, right? Everyone puts, everyone puts you know, the important stuff in the, in the severe or critical, and you know, the, in, the info stuff would never be littered with debug messages, ever. No one would ever do otherwise. So tracking log data can easily be on the order of petabytes per month, uh, easily terabytes per day uh, for some enterprises. Uh, I should have clicked that through, but I didn't. Anyway, uh, tracing is an interesting one because tracing uh, has existed for a long time. Uh, Single-threaded processes could, could be traced uh, through non-distributed applications. That was something that you could do. Not everybody did it, but once we got into microservices land, it became a much bigger deal because being able to figure out what part of your service was causing a problem was suddenly really, really important because everything that used to be a monolith was now 200 different pieces and you know looked like this. Uh, obviously, this is a very extreme example from Uber, but I'm sure if you built out service maps of applications that you run at your jobs, they are probably somewhat similarly scary. Uh, but weirdly, you can still find lots of companies today who haven't touched distributed tracing at all. Um, I regularly speak to ones who like they're interested in it and they think it's a cool idea, but because it's not like hooking up your logs to a log tool or deploying a Prometheus exporter, it requires you to go in and change the code of your apps, varying levels of that, depending on whether you're doing auto or manual instrumentation, people are reluctant to do it because it's going to consume time. But those that do add it, what they find is that very, very quickly, they, they can have an instant explosion of data volume. 
uh, which immediately jumps into like the terabyte level territory on a regular basis. Uh, since tracing is just so rapid and so frequent, and so every little thing you add just explodes everything immediately. Uh, profiles, so I started to write like a little history thing for profiles, but then I realized this one already existed, so I didn't write one. Uh, this is very helpful. Uh, profile is really interesting because it's existed for some time. Uh, I know there was just a session about profile, so hopefully you got some good info there. Um, I was unfortunately busy furiously trying to figure out if I had to change all my slides to light mode, um, so I didn't get to watch it. <laughs> but uh, though Google talked about continuous profiling uh, back in 2010, uh, a lot of people really hadn't gotten into it in a big way until much more recently, it feels like, uh, even though it can really help narrow down performance bottlenecks. So some of the big uh, OSS uh, profiling tools, obviously Polar Signals that you saw this morning, uh, Pixie, uh, Pyroscope, those are like the ones that I hear about most often in those spaces. But overall, still, storing any kind of continuous data means that it consumes space. Uh, so the more of it you do, the more storage you need. Uh, I don't have as much data on how big the volumes of profiling uh, people are running are, just because it seems to be the one that people are doing the least so far. So there's not really enough data quite yet, but it still does consume a bunch of data. So where do we land? So I know it looks like I'm about to break these volumes out by telemetry, uh, but I'm actually not, because overall, the answer is mostly the same uh, for all of them. So volumes these days, depending on your application estate size, can be anything from terabytes to petabytes per month, uh, or uh, gigabytes to terabytes per week or even day. And this is a ton of data. And it comes with its own downsides other than just what it costs, which is what I'm going to get to next. Large volume problems. So the first problem uh, with large telemetry volumes is storage. So storage may have gotten cheaper uh, over the years, uh, especially given the rising popularity of object storage. Uh, but it's not free. Nothing's free. If you're in your own data center, uh, your storage can become full pretty quickly uh, at the volume levels I previously described. And then what? You're down to either rejecting new data or pruning old data indiscriminately. And neither of those is really ideal, is it? The second problem is writes. Even if you could store all of that data cheaply, it isn't free to get it into your system of choice. So you also have to do any necessary compression and processing before it's written to a long-term storage. Then you write it to storage. And all of those activities, they burn processing power. Uh, they burn memory. They burn uh, network bandwidth and disk usage, even if it's like temporary usage for while things are going through different stages. The more data that you need to receive and store, the more expensive it is to receive and store it. If you're in your own data center, you're probably not paying the same for uh, network costs because you're not being charged by the gigabyte, but you're still paying for the max throughput because you still have to buy those devices. And you're paying for the CPU and the memory and the disk, and they all cost money either way, whether it's public or private. Granted, it's CapEx versus OpEx, but you're paying for it either way. <clears throat> On a private uh, data center, maxing out means rejecting new data. And in, on public cloud, it means either you're rejecting new data because you you're deliberately not scaling, or uh, you do scale, and the public cloud lets you scale as far as you need to go, but now your costs have become absolutely ridiculous. The third problem is reads. So even if you could store all of that data cheaply, and even if you could write it and compress it cheaply, you still need to actually read it back out uh, for it to be useful. So indexing data, traversing it, splitting big queries into multiple smaller ones so that you can run them in parallel and get people their actual query result faster uh, with a lower execution time. Uh, all of those activities, just like writes, uh, burn processing power, they burn memory, they burn network bandwidth, and disk usage. And the more data that you stored, the more expensive it is to iterate over it, index it, query it, and so on. 
Network traffic is less of a concern sometimes on the read side, at least if you're within like a single AZ uh, on like a public cloud, but whether it's public or private, running these huge volumes means that you're paying more for CPU and memory and disk to do the necessary work to make the data useful. If you run out of capacity, now your reads fail or they become unacceptably slow uh, and the users get really unhappy because their query takes 45 seconds to return. Uh, I should have had this playing and I didn't, so. The fourth problem is on the expertise side. Uh, the larger your telemetry volumes, the larger the systems that you have to run to handle them. Uh, so that's either massive clusters or it's too many clusters or too many massive clusters if you're really in a bind. All of this requires more and more expertise. So we end up hiring more and more nerds like me and you uh, to help run these massive systems uh, at immense cost and you know, job security notwithstanding. Or you end up paying you know, a vendor to take this whole problem off your hands. Uh, but still, those massive volumes are going to cost you since any you know, SaaS observability vendor is charging my volume anyway. So what do people do? Uh, people often take uh, the very hasty and harsh approach of, well, this costs too much, uh, so stop doing it. So, you know, shut it all down. This is obviously bad since it reduces visibility indiscriminately. Or they might slice things up and only send their most critical metrics to their uh, good, expensive system. And for example, keep like their test metrics or their dev metrics on a cheaper, slower, uh, more cost-effective system that maybe works, but far less well. And uh, with a different user experience to the good system. Uh, this is bad since it means that users have to know two, two, two totally separate uh, user experiences with different feature sets. Uh, all their data isn't in the one place. Uh, they're less used to both systems and so on. Or they just abandon ship and they jump to another solution entirely, uh, thinking that it will be magically immensely cheaper somehow. And while this can somewhat work, if you were, for example, paying a SaaS vendor, since one might give you a drastically different uh, price to another one, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about OSS solutions. And the reality is everything requires, as I already said, CPU, memory, disk, uh, and network. So another tool isn't going to be magically 10 times cheaper than another one, uh, unless you were completely using the wrong tool for the type of data you were trying to store in it. The underlying backends, any kinds of databases, uh, they tend to gravitate towards similar performance levels over time. If somebody makes a leap and figures out a much better way to do something, the others will follow in some due time eventually. But you certainly will incur costs spending the effort to keep jumping tools all the time, uh, ultimately costing you more in the end. So what should people do? So on the metric side, there's a few major things that you can do. Uh, the first is on the scrape interval. Now, I know scrape interval is somewhat specific to Prometheus. Uh, it doesn't have to be scrape interval. I really just mean like the sample rate. So whether you're doing push or pull, like with OTEL and you're pushing data, the meaning is kind of the same. You're reducing the frequency at which you store data points, uh, which means there's less to store. So you might not need the fidelity you're currently configured for, but you may. So this is going to be your decision. And it's not binary either. You might have higher intervals and lower intervals, depending on the metric in question. The second thing you can do is downsampling. And this is kind of the same thing as scrape intervals, just done a little later, uh, because you're still just reducing the sample rate of what you're storing. So you might be doing this via like Prometheus recording rules or some other method before it gets to the long-term storage. Or maybe you're downsamp downsampling older data on the back end, akin to something uh, like, like to something what uh, Thanos can do. Um, but it's worth noting that if you do this, for example, to stock Prometheus data, uh, you can make it incompatible with other Prometheus type solutions because Prometheus natively itself doesn't support downsampling. So now you're modifying the original blocks and when you try to move them to another tool, it'll be like, I don't know what that data is. That looks strange. Third thing you can do is retention periods. So this might be like really obvious, but I'm gonna point it out. If you don't need to store longer 
our data longer than a given period of time, then don't. There are ways to manage this somewhat more granularly on certain systems. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Uh, some systems, um, like the different Prometheus cousins, uh, have, are multi-tenanted, and so you can say tenant A is three months, tenant B is six months, tenant C is 12 months, and you can send data to the ones that is appropriate for how long you want to store that data. Uh, the fourth thing you can do here is drop unused metrics. Now, it probably sounds simple in theory, but hard in practice, because how can you be sure what's actually unused? Uh, but uh, Grafana actually provides a tool to help you with this, if you're in Prometheus world. So we have a CLI tool called Mimir tool, and it does not require you to be using Mimir to use it. The name is a, a bit misleading in that way. But it has a subcommand called analyze. And what it can do is look at your Prometheus compatible backend and look at your Grafana instance, and it will say, hey, these are, all the, uh, these are all the metrics that you store that you don't query based off of what's in your dashboards, what's in your alerts, uh, what's in your recording rules, so that you can have an easy view of, well, what do I not need? And just strip those out via uh, relabel rules. The fifth thing here, one of the more technically like intelligent ones to do, is uh, to do aggregation. So uh, beyond dropping metrics in series that you don't use, you could aggregate away labels that you never query, dimensions you never look at. Uh, this is a more uh, complex operation, though, since you can't just drop labels willy-nilly without causing series conflicts, hence the aggregation piece. But uh, even though there, I wasn't aware of um, a particular tool to do this in OSS land lately, um, I did notice that there is a talk later on today at 4.30 p.m. around uh, IBM and Red Hat's OVM tool, which does have aggregation listed as one of its features. So I'm not going to steal their thunder, but maybe attend that at 4.30, because I'm going to. Um, so check that out. Uh, on the log side, we'll start with the one that everybody laughed at, which is use log levels correctly. Uh, if you're logging literally everything to info, instead of separating things correctly, then you're just storing tons of logs that you don't need. Um, so get this sorted. It has an enormous impact. The second thing you can do is sampling. And I mean sampling as the logs are being produced. So a logger component of a service can know how often it is producing certain lines. So instead of it pr producing the same error 2,000 times in the space of 10 seconds, you could have it not do that and just say, this line has been repeated 2,000 times and not actually spew it out and consume a bunch of data. That is a thing people can do. Uh, the next one is, again, retention. Already covered it. Don't store logs for longer than you need. If you do have compliance requirements here, though, which I know comes up a lot in the logging world, then send the compliance data to a backend with one retention policy and other data to a backend with a different one. Or you might have a tool that lets you do per stream retention. So you can say if it has label X stored for longer. That's totally a thing that you can do. Uh, the fourth one here is on policies. So establishing clear logging policies for developers. I've seen some companies who they've established really rigid policies for developers on what they're allowed to write log lines for. So for example, a log line has to always provide a particular level of information and be useful, useful in diagnosing a problem. If it's superfluous or it's something that you generally ignore, then it shouldn't be a log line at all. On the tracing side, remove unneeded attributes. People often add tons of extra attributes to their traces, both span attributes and resource attributes. This, these then increase your span size. And since tracing is such a high volume uh, data stream, the effect multiplies like very, very quickly. So you strip your attributes down to only what you actually need to query by and have in your results. If it doesn't help you, remove it. Uh, if it's better suited to another signal, move it over to that. Maybe it should be logs. Uh, sampling, uh, people generally don't capture 100% of their traces as uh, the volume would be crippling. Uh, so deciding exactly what to sample, though, is the challenge. You've got head sampling and you've got tail sampling. Head sampling is simpler. You're just on, on, on the face of it, on the front end, you're basically saying, oh, just I only want 5% of the data. But that's indiscriminate, and you can miss a lot of important uh, information. So generally, what you'd like to do is tail sampling, which takes in the context of the whole trace. Uh, and then it, you can decide, you know, I only want to capture errors, or I want to cap capture based on some attributes or based on certain latencies. It's a much more uh, logical way to do it. And we'll make sure that you're not missing data that is important. There are some OSS tools that work well for doing this. 
Uh, Otel Collector can do this, Honeycomb Refinery can do this, Grafana Alloy can do this, probably more. Retention period, already covered it. Don't store what you don't need. Uh, remove useless spans. So some people uh, have things instrumented that they shouldn't. You should only really be uh, instrumenting things that are meaningful bits of work that you need to know how they are performing. If something is always like really quick and isn't likely to ever cause a problem, then you don't need a span for that. And you can also break up logs, long spans, large spans, into smaller ones for very large complex operations. And this can make your tracing perform more efficiently and also you have a lower volume. I'm gonna try and run through the very end of this. Uh, for profiles, there's two things you can do. Uh, you can reduce how many targets you're sampling. Uh, if you're running many copies of an app, it's very likely that they're gonna perform somewhat similar because it's the same code. So you could sample less things there. And again, retention period, reducing how long you're storing the profiling data for. Uh, on the future side, there's a couple of things. So what, what people really want is a solution that just looks at what they're sending and figures all this out for them uh, and does all these things without them having to worry about it, either, either automatically or via approvable recommendations. So anything getting automatically run is gonna require tuning to some extent. It's hard to make something that suits everybody because priorities differ across companies. Cost over visibility, visibility over cost. Uh, some even favor speed over exact correctness. Some favor correctness above all else. Some workloads are prioritized over others and so on. So again, do take a look at that talk at 4.30 on OVM because I think it'll be really interesting. And uh, I already said that. And cool, so I'm at the end here. Um, I've run right up into the time almost exactly, so I'm very proud of that. Uh, links here. QR code if you want to rate it, and also come to the Grafana booth. Uh, it'll be open tomorrow. So thanks very much. Thanks, Eamon. And we, we have us some two minutes for questions. If you have any for Eamon, maybe it's the right time. So the lady, just give me one second. We have only one mic. You have a mic. Hi there. Hi. Uh, so you talked about establishing clear logging policies mm -hmm. to kind of help um, guide users or guide engineers in creating good logs. Um, are you aware of any ways to kind of um, systematically do this? <laughs> because I feel like when I create documentation, it doesn't get read, it gets ignored. Um, and we're kind of facing this issue where we're trying to rein things in. There, so depending on the tool you're using, you can do things like that. There are, there are ways to, for example, look for certain uh, labels in the logs, and if they're not there, just drop them. Um, but that assumes you're looking for specific labels for, for specific log content. You can do a bunch of processing there, again, depending on the tool, in your kind of logging pipeline. But the more of that you're doing, the slower you're going to make your pipeline. So if you're doing a bunch of like regex matching on every line that flows through, that's going to consume a bunch of resources as well which is you know, fine if you want to throw more resources at it to do that. But of course, anytime, as I was going over, like anytime you're processing stuff, that's more cost. Now, maybe it works out in the end because processing up front means less data stored later that, that then costs you more, but it's going to be like a balance, just figuring out like what can you map for and is it going to be worth the extra resources you have to run to filter in that like very, very uh, meticulous way. Thank you. We have a space for one more question. Anybody? There. Hi, uh, I'm Paolo Hi. from CloudFuse. Um, I had a question regarding, uh, so you mentioned in metrics and also in like uh, traces, there are ways in which we can reduce the data, right, by removing unused metrics or removing attributes from spans. But how do we know that it's not blocking uh, the discovery process like if somebody wants to build a dashboard, for example, and just looking for multiple metrics that they could build off of, uh, would we be not preventing them uh, by removing things that are not currently being used? Yeah, so if you, if you do drop metrics early on in, in the pipeline or you aggregate uh, certain things away, your end users might not know that you did that, and so they don't know why they're missing. And that's not ideal because they might expect those things to be there and then they can't build dashboards and they can't build alerts. Uh, there is, there's, there's a way that we've done this, for example, in, in uh, our cloud feature for this. Um, not trying to sell anybody anything, sorry, I'm just giving an example. But what we've done is 
we never drop a metric completely. We only aggregate away a bunch of the labels. So that means that when you try to query it, you can see that the metric exists, and we actually store as a label all the labels that we aggregated away. So you can tell by looking that this has been aggregated and exactly what dimensions have been aggregated away. And that means that a user can go in and go, oh, well, we, we stripped it out. Uh, and I want to get it recovered. And then they can follow whatever process they need to get it back. But at least then it's not just missing. And so that's how we handle that. Um, and that's, yeah, that's one way you can do it. <laughs>